Welcome to Staying Connected, a podcast where I talk to people about their stories with VEDS, Marfan, Lois Dietz, and related vascular and aortic connective tissue conditions. This is your host, Katie, and before we get into the show, I want to remind you that the views, information, and opinions in this podcast are those of the individuals involved, and the information presented does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. Any opinions that I express in this podcast are my own and not of my employer. In the last episode, we heard from Taborski McClellan about his experience with Marfan syndrome, including retinal detachments and an aortic dissection, and the book he wrote afterwards. Today, we're talking to Michelle Lucena, who was diagnosed with VEDS or vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome after two carotid artery dissections. In this interview, we talk about how these dissections affected her military career, how she's handled her diagnosis, and how she's held on to her passion of physical fitness. Let's get into the show. Thank you so much for joining me on the podcast to talk about your story with vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or VEDS. I would love it if you would introduce yourself to everybody who doesn't know you. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Lucena. I am a retired Coast Guard and was recently diagnosed in 2020 with vascular Ehlers-Danlos. And before we jump into your diagnosis story, what was your life like before this diagnosis? Shockingly, it was uneventful. I played sports as a kid. I was in martial arts. I played softball. I competitively swam, joined the military and served 10 years until I got injured. So it was a pretty low key, low injury, low event life up until 2020. Yeah. And tell me about how you got diagnosed then. It's a bit of an interesting story. I was in 2013, I was doing some laborious work in the Coast Guard. We were pulling on a 2,000 pound pipe that was attached to a crane to keep it from swinging. And the next day, I suffered a severe migraine that took me out of work for a couple days. Uh, Went back, everything was normal, went back to work, a couple weeks passed by. I did a leg workout that morning. And unbeknownst to me, I began having stroke-like symptoms throughout the course of the day. Long story short, after a few hospital visits and hearing my blood pressure in my ear, like a whooshing noise, I was advised to go back to the emergency room where I was diagnosed with an internal carotid dissection. What were those stroke-like symptoms? It started with a loss of vision in my left eye. It looked like, just like they describe in the literature, it was as if I was looking through a clouded piece of cloth in my left eye. And at the time, I thought it was an aura migraine because I used to get those. So I took a handful of aspirin and Motrin to prevent a migraine from coming on. And I was headed to a meeting with the Fort Lauderdale Police Department and my lieutenant to talk about uh, some Coast Guard related issues and fishing fisheries stuff. So by the time we got in the car, my vision had returned, so I thought nothing of it. As we were driving, my right arm began to feel weird, and, you know, I watch a lot of Grey's Anatomy, so the first thing I did was raise my arms above my head, because I, I, for some reason, was like, oh my god, am I having a stroke? And my right arm just happened to fall. I wasn't able to hold it above my head. So my next thought process was, is my speech impaired? Mm -hmm. So I continued to talk to my lieutenant, who was entirely unaware of what was going on. So I said, maybe I pinched a nerve while doing squats. Maybe I went too heavy. I got the feeling back in my hand while still driving. And then later on that day, my right leg started to go numb, I guess. It felt very weak. And again, I assumed that when I was squatting that morning, I may have leaned to the right. And had offset my weight when trying to do the squats because, you know, one side is stronger than the other. So I thought maybe I just had bad form in my squats and it caused an excess amount of fatigue in my leg. And then by the end of the day, 
my body itself felt weird, but the quote unquote symptoms had surpassed and I just thought it was all workout related. Yeah. So then how did you end up, how did you end up going from that to, I definitely need to go to the hospital? Well, I went to Coast Guard Medical and in true military fashion, they said, oh, all the corpsmen are doing training. We can't see you today. You'll have to go home. So I told the corpsman, I hope I don't stroke out in the car. Thanks for nothing. And left in a fit because nobody wanted to see me. Um, At the time, I was 31, very fit, very healthy. So it was assumed that I was probably a hypochondriac saying that I thought I had a stroke, right? So I went, I drove all the way home from Miami. It was about a 20 minute drive to where we lived. And my husband took me to our local hospital where they did a CT scan. Mm -hmm. But because that by now it was about seven, eight o'clock at night, the whatever now we know blood clot that had formed was gone because the CT scan was clear. They were like, we have no evidence that you're having a stroke, that you may have had a big stroke. Um, We're going to write you a doctor's note to spend three days at home, take some rest, and then you can resume normal duties as you see fit. And that was it for that week. I took the time off. Um, It wasn't until the following week I was walking around base and I could hear this whoosh, 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 whoosh in my left ear. And I thought that was really weird. I took to Google and actually came across a story of a guy who had a carotid dissection that experienced that specific symptom. Mm. So I went back to medical, as useless as they were. And at, at that time, a good friend of mine who's a corpsman was at the front desk. And she said, you're symptomatic. Go to the emergency room. Now's the time to go. So I got one of the on-duty non-rates to drive me to the hospital in Miami Beach. And after a very long, drawn-out emergency room visit, I was admitted overnight to get an MRI to see what was going on. And at the last minute, the admitting doctor ordered an MRI of the head and neck, and that turned everything around and led to the diagnosis. So what happened after that? You're admitted, they find the dissection of the carotid artery. I was rushed to the cath lab. I jumped the line. The The doctor had come in and said, you tore your carotid artery, you have an internal carotid artery dissection, and you require an immediate stent placement due to the severity that we saw on the scan. So they rushed me to the cath lab, jumped in front of everybody in line. When the doctor went in to place the stent, the scan showed my carotid was closed 60%. When he got in there, it was actually closed up 90% and torn in two different places. So it was a bigger dissection than, than the scan had led on to. So the stent he had at the time was too small. So I specifically remember one of, the, one of his assistants in the back room is sifting through the equipment to find a stent big enough for him. As I'm laying on the table, I can hear her rummaging around in the back room. <laughs> and then she's like, I got one. And uh, she brought it to him and he placed it with uh, no issues. But he told my husband after they had moved me to recovery, he met with my husband and he said I was lucky to be alive. Due to the severity of the stent, it in fact should have killed me. And he was surprised at how severe it was. Yeah. So did that change your military career at that point? Or were you still just moving along after that? Like, how did that change? It immediately ended my military career. Um, My command came to visit me. I spent five days in the ICU. My command came to visit me and I had asked them if I could change jobs to remain in the Coast Guard. Uh, The job that I was currently doing is called a BOSA mate and you drive boats and do a lot of laborious work, painting, sanding decks, line work, stuff like that. So I asked if I could change jobs to what's called a yeoman, which is basically a human resource specialist in the military. All desk work. um, But because I would be not considered worldwide deployable, that was a big fat no. They were like, no, you're done. So medical began the Coast Guard retirement process to 
do what's called a, a medical board. They send your injury and diagnosis to a, a board of panelists. They review it. They give it a rating just like the VA gives veterans once they separate. And the rating that the Coast Guard gives you determines if they separate you with a one-time payment or they retire you Mm -hmm. and send you off with a pension and medical insurance. So at this point, you still don't know that you have VADS, right? Not a clue. Not a clue. (laughs) Did you think anything of this carotid artery dissection? No, I was told by the doctors that it was spontaneous. Um, apparently that is a thing with some people. They said it was a one-time freak accident. Uh, The Coast Guard had kind of panicked because they had never heard of that happening. In fact, there is no VA disability rating for my specific injury. It's actually rated as a vascular disease. That's the closest thing that they could find to give me uh, compensation for what happened. So no, there was no mention of any genetic testing. There was no mention of potential disorders. They basically just retired me. It took two years to process me out. So I stayed on active duty, but didn't actually have to report for two years. And once October of 2015 came, I was officially retired from the Coast Guard and sent off into the civilian world. And what was that like for you? It was a very difficult transition. I had anticipated on doing 20 years. My husband and I had plans um, to go back to school, become an officer in the Coast Guard. If not an officer, I wanted to be a a drill instructor. My husband was previously one in his career, and I fell in love with the idea of training recruits and getting them ready to go into the service. And that was one of my bucket list items as far as jobs go in the Coast Guard. And it was all abruptly ended, and it took me several years to transition properly, mentally, out of the Coast Guard. Yeah. Um, it was tough. And how did you heal from that stroke? 100% no side effects. No, no abnormalities. That's great. <laughs> At what point did they start thinking about vets? It wasn't until I dissected the second time in 2018. I was back in the gym, uh, lifting weights. We got a little crazy and decided to start powerlifting because every from 2013 to 2018, everything was solid. I was working out every day, two, three hours a day in the gym, no problems. I relearned how to lift. So my strength started to increase. So we just followed suit and I found myself bench pressing 150 pounds for several reps in the gym. And I was very proud of that personal record. The VA at the time was willing to do follow-up MRIs of my existing stent because I had read in the literature that after a certain point, sometimes stents have a tendency to either collapse on themselves or there's a potential for blood clots. So I wanted to follow up on it and make sure that that it, it in fact was doing well. So the VA was doing annual scans of my head and neck And on one of these annual scans in 2018, the report said that I had an aneurysmal dilatation of the right carotid artery. Now, I'm no doctor, but I do know from experience that an aneurysm in your carotid probably means you tore it. So I reached out to my primary care. She advised that I reach out to my stent doctor who placed the original stent. They scheduled me in right away, despite his limited availability. They said, bring the disc. You're coming in next week. Mm -hmm. I came in with the disc. He called me into the room, pointed out the dissection, took one look at me and said, you were lifting heavy again, weren't you? He called me out. I had to admit it. And he said, you're getting yourself another stent. Mm -hmm. He's like, that was the treatment plan that worked well the first time. We're going to stent you the second time. So again, they scheduled me within a week. I was had an appointment at the hospital a uh, little less emergent this time. I didn't jump the line. They, uh, it actually took all day for him to do the actual procedure. Um, he took me in and wanted to diagnose it internally before even placing a stent. So he went in via catheter, looked at the dissection, said, yes, it's there. However, I have a lot more patients that I have to get to. We're going to put you back into holding. We're going to leave the catheter in. So you have to stay still. And then If we can, we'll get to you later on today and place the stent. My original appointment was at 11 o'clock in the morning. I was not stented until close to 7 p.m. that evening. 
I cannot With imagine the in my leg. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot imagine that experience. I <laughs> it was it was it was rough. Um the other option was for him to get to me the next day and to admit me into the ICU overnight mm-hmm. and then stent me in the morning. So I'm grateful. I'm grateful that he was able to squeeze me in yeah. to uh to stent me. And that stent was actually a double overlapped stent. So there's two of them in there that overlap each other where the dissection is. Okay. So that um, other that new dissection was pretty much like right next to the stent. It was one of each. Left the left carotid. Oh, one of each, left yeah. and right. Yep. So both of them went with it five years apart. So even at this point though, in 2018, there was still no talk of VEDs, connective tissue disorders, genetic anomalies, nothing. They just said you lifted too heavy. You did this to yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, don't ever do this again. And sent me on my way with, with annual follow-ups with the same doctor, right? So starting in 2018, I had to go back and see him annually. But it wasn't until 2020 that my hypochondriac self <laughs> thought about potential causes that could lead me to double dissect. And I came across a genetic panel that was called a thoracic aortic aneurysm dissection panel, Mm -hmm. found it on Google. And I went to my primary care at the VA and I was like, hey, um, I know this is kind of weird, but can you genetically test me for something that could have potentially explained these dissections? Because I can get on board with one being an anomaly and a spontaneous. What I can't accept is that both were spontaneous. Mm -hmm. I've been working out since I was 15 years old and now I'm in my 30s and you're telling me that my gym routine caused me to tear an artery. That doesn't sound normal to me. Yeah. So my primary care doctor said, I can't do it, but I'm going to refer you. We have a genetics department within the VA, which I had no idea about. Um, They're based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. So we set up a telehealth appointment. I met with the nurse She said, you don't look like you have any genetic conditions from what I can see on video. However, your two dissections are a red flag for me. So, yes, we will test you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, (laughs) all right, we were making some progress. So she sent me the saliva kit. They they FedEx it to me in the mail. I did my thing, sent it back. And this was right at the start of COVID. So so my whole routine had changed. I started working from home now and we've had all these other like worldly things going on, right? So I didn't think much of this genetic test that I was waiting on. I had actually kind of almost forgotten that I had sent it out because it took about three weeks like usual to get the results. And May of 2020, I think it was May 25th, 2020, I get a phone call from Utah. So I answer it and the nurse goes, I am so sorry. You tested positive for this this rare disorder called vascular Ehlers-Danlos. And she proceeded to explain the basics of the disorder to me. And pardon my language, but my initial reaction was, holy shit, (laughs) what is this thing that I just got, like, how bad is this thing that I just got diagnosed with? Because she sounds, she was visibly upset in her tone of voice having to explain this disorder to me. Mm -hmm. So I think she felt worse than I did initially (laughs) having to explain it. What did she tell you about it? Do you remember? She said, yes. She she basically explained everything because I, I, I went to the literature after, you know, right after the phone call. But she basically explained that it's connective tissue disorder. I make faulty collagen. Um, my entire vascular system is at risk to tear just like my arteries. They didn't explain too much of the actual mutation in which amino acids were, were impacted because she was just the nurse in the genetics department. But she did tell me that they were sending me letters to give my doctors in letters to give my family because the VA was going to be willing to test my immediate family members. So I got letters from my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother to, to send. They live in New Hampshire. So I had to, I scanned it and emailed it to them. And then she set me up with a telehealth appointment with her boss, who was a doctor, a geneticist in the, in the department who also knew of Ehlers-Danlos, vascular Ehlers-Danlos and the connective tissue disorders. So she wanted me to 
to learn from him in a more detailed manner than what she could provide me on the phone. Uh, so we set that up, I think it was for the following month, and I met on a video call with the three of them. And because of COVID, he talked about the, the high risk with COVID and how COVID was starting to come out as more of a vascular disease versus a respiratory infection. So he was like, make sure you stay home. And I was like, yeah, there's no problem. <laughs> and they said they could treat me if I wanted, but it would obviously be telehealth only due to their location. So they recommended I find a doctor locally who could see me in person if needed. So that's where I hit the internet to find a, a local doctor. Yeah. So then when you started doing your literature search, did you see like any of yourself in that? Like any, cause there's a lot, there's a lot of people that get diagnosed and they look back on their life and they're like, oh, I have this feature. I have this feature. I have this feature. And everything kind of just starts to be like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. Like, did you have that? Do you have any outward features of this? Nothing. Nothing. Just like the nurse said, I have no other red flags that would have caused her to test me for this particular disorder. I don't look the part. I've I've never dislocated a joint. My my doctor tested me. I have very little hypermobility that sometimes comes with the with the EDS portion of the disorder. My skin is not very paper thin. I mean, I heal fairly well. I've had scars before, biopsies taken, and I've always retained stitches really well. Never had any gastrointestinal issues. I I feel like part of that is because of my healthy lifestyle and the food that I eat, and I contribute a lot of that to the the way I've lived since being in the in the military. Um, I was overweight at one point and had a come to Jesus moment where they almost kicked me out for being too fat. So I changed my lifestyle drastically to include food and fitness and all that stuff. But no, I never had any injuries. I never um, I had I'm now learning that growing pains as a child may be linked huh. To the disorder, I had, I remember distinctly crawling in tears into my parents' room because my knees were in so much pain when I was like 12. Yeah. Um, and it was, char I'm five foot one, so I don't know how much growing I was actually doing with these quote unquote growing pains. <laughs> <laughs> As an adult, I find it hard to believe that that's what it actually was now, now that I've, you know, peaked at five feet, one inch. Um, that's so relatable. <laughs> 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 so relatable. I, I read a post. I read a post recently that was more more along the lines of Ellers Danlos versus vascular Ellers Danlos. But there was a lot of people with EDS and uh, and heads that had growing pains as kids, and they're trying to link it to the actual um, Ellers Danlos disorder itself. So I guess maybe that would be the only thing that I had as a kid. But yeah. like I said, I did competitive martial arts. I I did competitions and fought with other people in the sparring competition and never got injured never i've never even so much as had a bloody nose yeah in all of my sports so <laughs> it came as a complete shock and and uh how did i get this mentality like yeah if i live my life normally for so long like how did i end up with this disorder because so far nobody in my family has been diagnosed. I'm the only one. Yeah. Do you know what kind of mutation you have? I have a glycine to serine. Uh, so from what I understand is that it's a smaller amino acid, which would explain my lack of other events and lack of issues. So I guess if I have to have the disorder, I'm very grateful that my body chose to mutate a smaller amino acid, giving me a fighting chance. Yeah. <laughs> and allowing me to still maintain some activities in my life. Yeah. Let's talk about activities a little bit. So perhaps you can paint us a picture of, you know, when you say like weightlifting, like what was your regular level of exercise prior to your diagnosis with VEDS in 2020? Because I want to talk about how that changed after. I would frequently lift for two to three hours every morning in the gym. Uh, when I was active duty, I would get to the base around six o'clock in the morning and would lift until eight, eight thirty ish. Um, this was all free weights. Uh, we had very few machines in the gym, but it was all like 200 pound squats, 
205 pound deadlifts, uh, benching, you know, 40, 50 pound dumbbells for all for reps. I never did PRs because I always lifted by myself. So I never had a spotter until, um, until I got the first dissection, then I would work out with my husband. But even after the first dissection, I would go to the gym from seven o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the morning, waiting for my stepdaughter to get out of class. So to pass the time, I would lift for an hour and a half, all free weights, and then do 45 minutes of cardio on the machines and then pick her up at 10 o'clock. My husband and I ran five, six miles a day up until 20. In t- 2019, I was actually prepping for a bodybuilding competition. I was going to compete for the first time. So I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning to get to the gym for five, lifting till about 630 and then going into work, eating six meals a day, um, had my workouts planned by a coach. They were... A lot of body weight and free weights. So it was pretty intense lifting for the most part. Yeah. So then how did that change immediately after your diagnosis of VADS? I was told to stop altogether at first. And they tried to limit me to a 20-pound restriction. And my first argument is we have five dogs. And I do the grocery shopping. My dog food bags are 40 pounds a piece. I buy two every month at Costco. My husband does not come with me. If you restrict me to 20 pounds, I cannot do my grocery shopping alone. So that was out of the question. I said, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. So I had a long conversation with my doctor and told her, my strength levels are not that of a normal 35-year-old females who otherwise hasn't been active in the gym. I said, I do 70-pound lat pulldowns. I do 90-pound leg extensions. And these are all for like, 15 reps. We're talking some, I don't want to say serious strength, but I had a a strength level that I was proud of. Mm -hmm. So I said, you're going to have to compromise with me because working out helps me mentally. It will set me into a depression for sure if you restrict my workout routine. So I got her on board. We agreed. Uh, I already knew from the first dissection not to Valsalva, so no straining. Um, And that's when I learned to relift in the gym without straining. Um, Anytime I was doing an exercise and I would hit peak muscle failure, I would stop wherever I was in the exercise and call it quits for that set. And then we would move on to the next exercise. So there was never any straining or pushing past failure on any of my lifts. Mm -hmm. To do that requires very strict form which is super important just for injury's sake, right? As a physical fitness enthusiast, I hate to see people lift with incorrect form because that just leads to injury and and horribleness in the gym. So I came to a compromise with my doctor and because I got diagnosed right around COVID, conveniently, all the gyms shut down. Mm. So I did have about a six-month period of time where I wasn't lifting and working out. But we have since built a home gym in our outside porch that is filled with a Bowflex and different various weights of dumbbells. So my strength has decreased over the years due to not lifting the free weights and stuff in the, in the commercial gym, like I used to, but we still do. I do more functional training now, uh, kettlebell swings, squat to shoulder press, incorporating more muscles to, to kind of work with some injuries that I'm dealing with post military service. Mm-hmm. Uh, in order to stay in shape. Yeah. So my workouts are a little less often right now, Uh, probably only two to three times a week. I'm trying to push for for more often. I still have the mindset that I would like to compete in bodybuilding at some point. I don't know how likely that is. I think it's possible. I think I could do it just not to win anything, but just to say that I checked a bucket list item and competed in a competition. Probably going to wait till I'm like 45 to get into that master's category. So maybe there's less people to compete against. <laughs> <laughs> Give myself a fighting chance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's where I'm at physically. I I, uh, I have an Instagram that I post frequently. It's a fitness only Instagram that I post recorded videos of me lifting. Different, different styles of workouts. Uh, nutrition tips all sorts of stuff trying to, in fact, I, I have recruited a few 
social media folks that are diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos and one in particular with vascular, who may have vascular Ehlers-Danlos that have reached out to me asking me, what do you do physically? I I don't want to stay out of the gym. I want to be able to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Can you give me any guidance? So they now follow my social media as like a form of inspiration. So it's given me some, some motivation to keep posting content yeah. on there. Yeah. And that's such an interesting, I mean, it's a, it's such an important thing, the balance between like, what's striking to me is the balance between your physical health and your emotional health and the, you know, your life prior to your VEDS diagnosis was really built around lifting and physical activity. And what does it do when you're told absolutely don't do any of that and it, you know bringing it back to okay you have a small amino acid mutation um when your dissections happened like you were lifting really really heavy compared to you know just lower lower weight reps in the gym right mm-hmm. so do you do just lower yep. lower weight now I mean, I guess with the, I'm not familiar, I've never used a Bowflex, so I'm assuming it's, I have no idea. <laughs> the, the Bowflex is all resistance. Okay. Weight training. Um, there are these bars in the back that you hook into that are rated for like 50 pound resistance, 10 pound resistance. So when I say that I bench press or my lat pull down is a hundred pounds on the Bowflex, that is very different than doing a hundred pounds on a machine in a commercial gym. A hundred pounds on the machine is a, a, is significantly heavier than the resistance on the Bowflex. The Bowflex resistance is probably more like a hundred pound resistance on the Bowflex is probably equivalent to about 50 pounds on a plated weight machine. So there's a big, there's a big difference. So the Bowflex is more for toning and maintaining any current muscle mass that you have. And then I use the dumbbells and the kettlebells to build additional muscle. Yeah. Um, because I'm not in the gym like I was, I have lost quite a bit of strength. I think I got back to benching 40 pound dumbbells before I had taken a, a short break from lifting. So now I'm back down to about 30 pounds, which is still significant for somebody my size, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's not where I'm at. And I, I really have to work mentally to get myself out of the mindset of, oh, I used to do this because I'm still there. I'm still in that spot where, oh, I used to deadlift 205 pounds. I used to bench 110 on the barbell bench press. And, and we can't go back to that now that I've been diagnosed. So now I have to train differently and almost forget what I used to do so that it doesn't impact me mentally. Like I, it, when I was in the Coast Guard, one of my records was doing 88 pushups in a minute for, for a PT test. I'm lucky to do 10 without dropping face first on the ground right now. Yeah. So for me, that's a big mental battle because I used to be in such good shape pre-dissection to the point where now I can't even do 10, 15 pushups in the course of 60 seconds. Mm-hmm. And will I ever do 88 pushups in a minute again? Probably not. I have no need to, but I would like to get back to a, a state where I can do like to me, 20, 30 in a row, yeah. regardless of time would be a good place to get to. And so it's, it's a different, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult mental journey now trying to find my, my new place in the physical fitness world yeah. while maintaining my, my health. Yeah. So I would love to put your fitness Instagram and in the episode show notes. So for anybody out there that's listening, absolutely. It will be down there. Absolutely. Yeah. I, it's, it's so important. I think it's so important finding that balance and, you know, with safety in mind, you know, it, it's, it's so important. For sure. Um, we're getting near the end of our time here. I want to ask you, do you have, any advice for somebody else who went through what you went through? Trust your instinct. I was misdiagnosed heavily by the Coast Guard. They actually told me my stroke was a migraine. They said migraines can mimic strokes, which is true. I, I know there's a subset of migraines that can mimic stroke symptoms. Um, but I've had migraines since I was 12. Never once in 15, 20 years have I had a migraine mimic stroke symptoms. So for me, that didn't fit the, fit the puzzle that I was experiencing. And 
my husband even got a little upset at me when I was in the emergency room and told the doctor, I think I had a stroke because he thought I was bad jujuing myself. He thought I was like going to bring in some bad juju <laughs> and, and get this weird diagnosis, which it turned out I did. But because he was so stressed in that environment, that was his only reaction. And he's like, you don't, you're not a doctor. How, do, how would you know if you had a stroke? And I'm like, well, I wasn't normal during that experience. That for sure I know. And um, I never gave up in my persistence to find an explanation as to what happened after that second, the second uh, dissection. I just, I feel fortunate that I have a primary care doctor who essentially gives me what I want at the VA. If I ask for a test, if there's an inkling that I have a, d a disorder that we haven't uncovered yet, she's 100% on board with trying to diagnose, test, figure out what's going on. And I know a lot of people in the civilian medical sector are not that fortunate. And don't be afraid to, to doctor hop. I mean, it, it, sometimes it looks bad in the eyes of the doctor, but you gotta, you gotta, if you, you know your body. I knew my body 100% based on my physical experience and everything. Mm -hmm. And I knew something didn't add up. But, Fair warning, I did not go to Dr. Google. I actually, I may have been on Google, but I looked at peer-reviewed literature because the scholar in me knows that WebMD will tell you you're dying versus a peer-reviewed journal by renowned doctors will actually give you better insight into your symptoms or what might be happening. Um, but don't give up. Don't If you think something's wrong, push until you get an answer because it's life-changing. It. I can't imagine what would have happened had we not been diagnosed. I would probably not listen to my doctor and go, gone back to bench pressing 150 pounds in the gym. And who knows, at that point, I may have an aortic dissection now that, you know, if I hadn't known. Yeah, that's great advice. And what do you want medical professionals to know about either VEDS or living with it? It's, it's a hard question to answer because in my experience, like I said, I'm very fortunate, especially where I live geographically, to have really good hospitals. I haven't come across any doctors that dismiss my disorder. I know others have, and they see it as a hypochondriac, and they see it as, you know, it's one of those invisible disabilities, right, that everybody um, denounces because they can't see what's actually going on with you on the outside versus, like, an amputee at the VA. Like, we know he's missing a leg. We know he's got other complications, I come in and I go to physical therapy and I'm the most in shape person there. So I, I wish doctors would not be so quick to dismiss you like they did with me when I said, hey, I think I had a stroke. And they're like, no, you didn't. And I'm like, I, who are you to tell me what I didn't and did experience? Like, and, and then they were eating their humble pie afterwards because they almost killed me yeah. in a sense. And they were terrified to let me back into the service because they thought that it was going to lead to further complications, and potential death. Um, so had they listened to me initially, we may have sped the process up and getting uh, a diagnosis um, and getting the right care. Yeah. Thankfully, nothing else happened. But I, I am in the rare Global Genes medical student program where I meet with med students every rotation and tell them about the disorder. So I, I'm trying to do my own part in spreading awareness of vascular ehlers danlos now that I know about it, in the hopes that if they were to come across the rare zebra in their career after they're a med student, it might pop up in their memory. Oh, this is similar to somebody that I spoke to who does have the disorder. Let's let's push for insurance to cover the test and, and investigate. Worst case scenario, a test says somebody's negative. I mean, right? Yeah. No harm, no foul. Yeah, that's so true. And that's such a great program. I'm going to link that in the description below too. That's It's an amazing program. Yeah, that's the, is it the Rare Compassion Project? Is that what it's called? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I yep. love that program. So it will be linked below for anybody who wants, I think periodically they like open up applications for people to they come do. on and then it might they be do. shut. So if at the time, if you're listening to this and at the time that you click on it, there's no openings, check back in a few months because they, they do like open and close the program as needed. Every, every four months they open the program and you can, you can, once you get in the program, you can continue to stay in there. I just, I'm on my third med student. Um, in fact, the med student I'm with now, 
I was with the very first time that I was in the program. So two years later, we met back up. That's awesome. And he's, he's basically been able to follow me through my diagnosis and my lifestyle changes. So we've taken a little bit different approach this rotation and just like following up with my care and the VA and how I'm, I'm getting on, you know, three years later. So it, you might end up with the same student that I think that's even better because they get to f- almost follow you yeah. through the process. That is so awesome. I love that you're doing that. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I think it's so important. And there is like, you know, there's, I, I think your what your story, part of what your story demonstrates to me is this varying severity of the condition, right? It's like, or not varying severity, but I mean, like the spectrum, it really displays like the spectrum of what you can deal with, with VEDS. And I don't think it's very often that I've had somebody, like, I think there's a lot of people with small amino acid, like serine substitutions walking around in the world that don't know that they have it. And I just feel really grateful to know you and to have you come on the show and share your experience with that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I want to let people know that even though I know that there's so many out there that have much more complications and stuff like that, your physical health is so important in combating the additional disorders that could come with a meds diagnosis. And I'm a firm believer that diet impacts a lot of what people experience um that is probably a bigger transition for them to change than maybe some lifestyle changes from beds you know not eating the junk food or removing seed oils or like getting down to the nitty-gritty stuff that can cause inflammation uh, autoimmune disorders stuff like that and if you find yourself combating multiple issues we could take a look at diet and, and exercise i think i'm joining forces with somebody else in, in the in the community and we're going to put some videos out there for Veds Awareness Month in October on working out and what you can do with even a five or 10 pound dumbbell if you do have those restrictions. Yeah. So you're not totally limited to live an unhealthy lifestyle just because you have this disorder. That's wonderful. And I think by the time you're listening to this episode, those might already be out. So I'm going to be sure to link whatever you all did in the episode yes, show notes yes. too. Yes, we're going to have <laughs> several videos. I have to get to recording in my outside gym, different workouts, different body function workouts, different um, trying to keep in mind that I'm going to try to use lower weights. So it doesn't seem so impossible. If somebody sees me benching 30 pounds, yeah, I could, I can give you a workout with 10 pounds. That'll make you feel like you, you know, really worked your muscles. So it, we'll, we'll get some, some content out there for everybody That's and awesome. hopefully change some lives in the process. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michelle, for coming on and sharing your story. No, thank you for having me. Thanks for tuning in to this episode featuring Michelle Lucena sharing her story with vets. Links mentioned in the interview, including her fitness social media handles and the Rare Compassion Project, are in the episode show notes, along with some other links if you're ready to meet others, get involved, or need support. There's also a link for the VEDS Collaborative Natural History Study, a research study led by Dr. Shireen Shalhoub, open to people with VEDS, Marfan, Louise Dietz, and similar connective tissue conditions. On the next episode, we'll be talking to Lauren Atherton about her experience with Louise Dietz syndrome. If you like this show, be sure to share it on social media, and you can also support the production of this podcast by joining my Patreon. As always, my top tier patrons are listed in the episode show notes. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon.